Welcome to Amplify, the podcast for accounting firm growth. I'm your host, Chris Camara. Today, I'm super excited to discuss marketing technology and the lead gen process with Danny Estrada, the vice president of consulting at Rare Karma. Danny has been a CRM evangelist and expert at leveraging technology platforms to create business value. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show today. But before we jump in, why don't you tell us a little more about yourself? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so uh, my CRM and marketing automation journey uh, began uh, prior to Y2K when nobody really even knew what these technologies were or were all about. And they were, they were quite honestly not as robust as the platforms that we have today. Um, and through that journey, just uh, crossing the year 2000, um, the consulting firm I worked with, you know, we were about 700 people across the US. We dealt also in accounting systems. So that began my journey with accounting firms. And, and shortly thereafter, I had partners of accounting firms asking me about these technologies and what it meant to them. And here we are over 20 years later. And and really, that's become my life's work of uh, heavily working with, you know, the biggest of the big where I even worked uh, as, the, as the internal person handling uh, senior director for sales platforms at KPMG, but also working with, you know, uh, I think one of my most recent clients was as small as 15 uh, people and two partners. So it really runs the spectrum. Roll out the red carpet. Celebrate your professionals. Be seen. At Ingenuity Marketing Group, we personalize your approach to attract talent and win business. In our world, accounting professionals are the celebrities. That means branding, PR, and content that ranks you higher. For visibility, faster marketing ROI, and more time in your day, contact our in-house specialists at IngenuityMarketing.com. Thanks, Danny. So let us know what technologies are needed for a firm to be successful in lead gen. So lead gen is really a, an interesting concept. So I think one of the things that's really been more evident as, as technology and time has progressed is accounting firms are, are originally were very um, resistant, I will say, to the way what we call industry or anything outside of an accounting firm does things. And so uh, a lot of what I'll relate here is if if you handed me the keys and I were to run any type of firm that's looking to make profit and needs to find customers, uh, the concept of leads is is really, um, you know, one of those things that's been really um, interesting because if you ask 10 people in a firm what a lead is to begin with, you get 10 different definitions. So uh, one of the things that's important is, is to establish some type of foundation. So a foundation would not only be a database or a data source, you know, originally in the old days, it was, you know, uh, a spreadsheet, it was a Rolodex, it was, um, you know, even something as, as simple as a, a contact manager in the old days like ACT, which actually a lot of partners and firms I've met have, have really liked over the years. Um, but a lead gen starts with the ability to, to see information that is generally incomplete. So uh, one of the things I've said in a lot of my speaking engagements, whether you know at SAP or Salesforce or Microsoft is um, if it's not written, you know, if it's not written down, it's not strategic. Uh, and so that's the importance of technology in the lead gen process is really to have some type of data source to understand what you know and what you don't know. Um, because there's this concept of qualification, which is first, do I have all the relevant information to understand whether this is a consumer of my services? And so you need certain information. Like, where do they work? How big is the company? How many employees do they have? What industry are they in? Um, and so, you know, CRM technology gives you the ability to actually collect that. The other concept within a lead that I, I find very confusing to people 
is when technology companies, CRM companies originally created this area called leads in their database, um, is that most people think of a lead as a living, breathing heartbeat, which is true. But if I'm a marketer and I'm running campaigns, the concept of a lead is somebody who raises their hand. I, I'm interested. I would like to know more. I want to be contacted if these phrases sound familiar as outcomes. Coincidentally, you know, technologies like a Salesforce or, or Microsoft, um, you know, or, or even a HubSpot, they, they take in both. They take in contacts <laughs> that may be leads, and they also can be, hey, here's a respondent to a download of these materials, or they looked at these web pages, and that can also be a lead. Okay, Daniel, what do you mean? Well, I, as Danny Estrada, could actually be a lead because they don't know I work for Rare Karma or they don't know how big we are. Um, but at the same time, um, for a particular organization, I might raise my hand four or five times for different services. So I could be a lead in that sense, one as an individual, but I could also be a lead five or six times. And having a technology that lets you basically um, give information to, to the viewer of that information, which of those two it is, is important. And so a, a CRM technology is the baseline for being able to start your lead gen process. So more firms are adopting CRM, but not all yet are ready to make that investment. So can you do this without CRM? Um, you can do anything without CRM. Accounting firms have you know, that, that's been the crux of, if I go back to when I first started working with accounting firms, you know, year 2000, a lot of them didn't even have marketing departments, right? Because the traditional path for a partner was somebody takes you under their wing. They teach you how to build a network of people, you know, your real estate, your insurance, your, your uh, lawyers, and you, you share information with each other on potential, you know, buyers of your services. And so, I mean, I could literally use my, my, con my, my contacts and, and outlook to, to, to record these leads. So you can do it without CRM. It, it's, but it's, it's extremely difficult because as we now know, and what we learned through COVID is anybody who's working in information silos pays a penalty. And so having a holistic view across um, everybody in an organization, you know, five brains are better than one. And, and realistically, you know, we're all out there contacting people, meeting people, and somebody might have that missing information on a lead <laughs> that I don't have. Oh, Danny, he's vice president, you know, and they might go record that, right? Um, and so uh, you can do anything without CRM. It's just, you know, I hear so much about when I talk to partners, picks, managing partners, that concern with time, right? How much time does it take me to do everything? And so you know, the small investment of CRM relative to what somebody's time is worth. Um, my personal belief is, no, you can't do it without CRM. And then I'll take one little note to your point about adoption. Having a CRM is not adopting a CRM. And that's, so 20 years ago, it was, you need a CRM. And today, the biggest problem is you need to use your CRM. Right? That's, right. that's the challenge for today. Right. So, yeah, l let's talk about marketing technologies. How important is it for marketing technologies to talk to one another? And what about to other firm technologies like time and billing? Is that important? Yeah. So there, there are, oh, you just opened up a whole can of worms. <laughs> uh, so uh, marketing technology. So this is almost parallel to your question about 
the the concept of do I need a CRM, right? Because if I already know a partner still today, uh, dependent on their age, still heavily rely on the networking model to grow a, a, a book of business. Um, having another set of buyers that buy in a different way that, you know, these things are, are mutually exclusive. You can still build a book of business the way you always have, but why wouldn't you want everybody that could buy what you sell? Right. And so, um, people that, you know, when, when we look at, again, going back to how industry looks at it, how a rare karma might look at it, um, whether it's products or services, because of these little devices that we hold in our hand and access to information, um, having the prettiest brick and mortar digitally and being able to navigate and find the information that I want, because 70% of the buying process is already done before somebody talks to a human for the first time. For those people that buy on collecting information themselves, not necessarily the referral, which is that other building a book of business that that partners tend to tend to work with. So what does marketing technology have to do with all of that? Well, if somebody walks into your store, I don't know if you've ever walked into a dollar store and if you've ever walked into the Apple store, those experiences are vastly different, right? And the reason that I say that is marketing technology, again, pro provides a foundation for it, for the, the buyer or prospective buyer to be able to gain the information they want with the best experience possible. And so if that's what I'm looking for, if I'm going to bother put up a digital store, why, why wouldn't I get the benefit of marketing technology that makes it much easier for me to tell my story of, Hey, here's this week's special, or, you know, you know, for those people that are now doing, you know, a, a lot of niche marketing, um, being able to tell you where the pasta is down the aisle, <laughs> that kind of thing very easily. And then marketing technology gives me intelligence as a firm as to whether people like the design of my store, whether it's easy to navigate, where they go most often, what they're really interested in. And then that enables me as a marketer to actually do what I'm hired to do, which is convince them we are for you. And so marketing technology does all of those things. It gives you the foundation. It gives you the ability to communicate. It gives you the ability to tell a story. It gives you the ability to do analytics and understand how well what you think you're doing is being received on the other side. So and in I firms, there was another question there too, but that, 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 that's the first piece on marketing technology. Oh, he's talking about, um, how about connecting to billing. firm technology like time and billing? Is that the can of worms you were talking about? Yeah. So <laughs> back in 2013, I was asked to integrate a certain Walters Kluwer uh, time and billing technology that shall remain nameless, uh, but everybody knows what it is. Um, and, and at that point, people were saying, well, you know, this really can't be done. Right. And, and, it was funny because I came across a firm that was about to do their fourth, third CRM in four years. And the managing partner, I was like, maybe you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe it's not the tech, right? Um, I'm like, the reason, and this goes to that adoption thing that I was talking about before, is that um, having the ability to understand um our, our clients, what they have, what they don't have, what they bought, what they've not bought, like all of these different things. You know, I can't tell you how many interviews I've done with partners and firms that have had this quest for being able to do cross sell, right? For forever. But they've got seven jobs to do today when they woke up and making the time for two partners to compare lists and compare notes is painful at best. Right. It, it is and in general, it just doesn't happen. Right. But the thing that 
for most firms, and we, we look at the dollars, right? It takes about seven times the dollars to get a new client than it does to sell something to somebody you've already sold something to. So time and billing is what I call the brass ring, right? And when, you know, I talk with a lot of growth officers in, in, in the accounting business, you know, the, some of them are very, very smart in trying to be data-driven organizations, right? What do we sell most often, right? What, what's most profitable, those kinds of things. And so, you know, a lot of times when I tell people, you know, all right, so let's say, you know, like a lot of firms have bookkeeping services. Let's say you've done a 1065 or 1120 to a firm under $20 million and you've never sold them bookkeeping, right? That all comes out of time and billing. The service codes are there, right? If, if you've sold an audit, but never a benefit plan audit, you know, th those are, those are the things that used to be come to the surface very quickly when your firm was smaller and, you know, the, you had this, this desire of, you know, I've got to hunt in order to eat. <laughs> um, but nowadays, as firms get consolidated and firms get bigger and bigger, th there's just, there's magic in those numbers, right? How much did this, you know, client buy last year versus this year, right? Those different types of things. Um, how much is in WIP, right? <laughs> What's sitting out there that we haven't billed for yet and the visibility on that because the time and billing systems themselves, they're there for a reason, right? They're, they're there to record history, not to make it, right? And CRM and marketing technology is there to make history, right? Make something else happen. And so when you, br when you can bring the information over to one side that naturally knows how to do what we talked about before, which is you know, the marketing or business development effort, those things can um, start to accelerate growth very, very quickly when, when you when you bring information that is siloed um, and, and do it electronically by removing the barriers of people having to work with people to get access to information that just should be flowing. So that leads me to the next question. Um, so when firms do have CRM and marketing automation in place, Tell me more about what other things they should consider layering in. Well, let's start at the beginning. And I don't mean like, all right, there was an explosion and the earth cooled. Um, we'll go, we'll, go, we'll fast forward a little bit. Um, so start at the beginning means, okay, we've, we've already talked about lead gen. We've talked about the concept of creating a lead. We've talked about, okay, um, at what point do we engage with the client and conversations. So it typically happens next. And what's also a time suck and also a potential legal liability is things like proposals and engagement letters. So those things, you know, I've seen firms where I've seen partners who are using engagement letters that were created last week or proposals that were created last week and some that are supposed to be using the same one and are using one from three years old, that's three years old on their desktop. Mean, meanwhile, they've updated terms, they've updated legal liability clauses and things like that. Um, and and they've they've updated branding, right? Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing that the value of, of accelerating engagement letter and proposal automation um, is, is two things. Right. It's, it's very beneficial to the firm because, again, you know, I go back and it's weird because like when somebody says when you talk to an accounting firm and they think it's going to be a CRM answer. Right. And they say, so what's the number one issue that you deal with? I said, my issue is the managing partners issue. There's not enough. There's not enough time. There's not enough staff. There's not enough people. So if I can simplify and alleviate and make time now available it's like i added headcount to the firm right the second thing that happens is that client experience right 
So for instance, like in our world, right? So if you and I were working on something and you told me I need a non-disclosure agreement before we can go forward, which happens in the accounting world, I click two buttons in my CRM and literally you see it there for signature while you're sitting at your desk on the same Zoom or phone call and we continue to move forward, right? And then if I literally propose something to you and you say, get me an engagement letter or, or a proposal out or a contract, again, I go to CRM, I click, you know, first button is which, which version of this form do you want? And second click is which contact is it going to? And boom, it's out for signature, right? Think about what that says to the client on the other side, because every firm, every firm out there is always saying we're a high level of service. But your representation of that actually starts from the first time you start engaging with people. So if it takes you a day and not a minute to get an NDA out to somebody, they're like, huh, wonder how that would go in relation to, you know, my corporate tax return, right? And if they ask you for a proposal and they're asking three firms for a proposal and yours comes out in five minutes and they're still trying to get it from the other firms a week from now and you go ask the question, hey, um, how's it going with the other people responding to this? And if you ask that question an hour after you sent the proposal, then it kind of puts the burden on the other firms. And so... Yeah, those those are the the types of things that we're seeing. We're seeing advances in things like um, uh, tie-ins and integrations with human resource systems, right? Um, I know a lot of firms that are now using marketing technology for their candidates, and they're actually doing the whole recruiting process because a lot of HR systems, and again, we'll leave the vendors out of this, but those are ugly technologies to fill things out in and, and track things in. And so we're more commonly being asked, hey, can you integrate with, you know, this HR system, this HR system? And they're running the whole candidate process completely through marketing automation, which in the case, a lot of these marketing automation tools, they're great at being able to handle just an individual contact, not necessarily an organization and running them through a nurture process because you're still selling, <laughs> right? You want to get the candidates in the door. The more candidates that you have, the more quality that you have to choose from, and thus ultimately a better, a better product as, you know, staff members of the firm. So those are probably a couple of the, of the more prominent areas that we're seeing right now. You talked about this earlier, but um, <clears throat> one of the main reasons firms struggle is getting people to use it, right? And you talked about that a little bit earlier. And cost, that's another struggle. So can you talk about these and maybe to start with the adoption and getting buy-in and then um, moving on to using it? Does everybody have to use it? So great question. Um, so adoption is is like if I ask 10 people adoption, like the like the 10 people leads, it's the same, same thing all over again, right? I get 10 different definitions, right? So one of the things that I did with, uh, actually one of the well-known A members um, is I said, look, going into this, what we really need is, you know, uh, a playbook, right? So what we need is common business terminology, what we need is best practices, the whys, not, not how to enter an opportunity or how to enter a, an account or a contact, but why. What's the benefit to the firm and what's the benefit to me? Uh, how does it impact me? And then there needs to be basically what's what I would call the you know commandments, thou shalt do this or thou shalt do that. And that, that's basically setting expectations and accountability within the firm. And so what comes out of that is adoption. So if you're meeting the minimum expectations of the firm, then it is adopted, right? So who has to? Um, you know, I know another firm that that codes their their staff and their partners by colors according to whether they're you know, a doer, a servicer, whether they're a business developer or whether they're a hybrid, right? 
and that changes the adoption equation, right? Um, in order to be adopted in general terms, what I tell people is you have to wake up and you have to be better today in what you have to go out and do today than you were before you ever knew what CRM was, right? So it has to provide benefit to you. It can't just be solid data entry. It can't just be, right, these different things. So generally, you know, younger staff, professionals, you know, they're not heavy users of CRM. Their activities might be seen in CRM or might be logged or, um, but as I go up the food chain, as I become a manager, as I become a principal, as I, as I start to get involved in the actual quoting of services and the proposal process. So whatever that is, is it, it increases my level of usage for what I go through during a given day. Um, so adoption in that sense is, again, if it's way easier to do the proposals and to do these things than it was five years ago, then why wouldn't I, right? Just absolutely, why wouldn't I, right? It's, it's a, it, 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 okay, it used to take me an hour to do this. Now it takes me 10 minutes. So adoption is really, you can't spare 10 minutes. Right. And then I wrote an article on the columnist for CRM magazine. And I wrote a I wrote um an article about my favorite physics teacher in high school. Uh still remember his name, Mr. Mullen. He was our tennis coach. And um the concept of an inelastic collision. Right. So you can't create energy. Energy just exists. Right. So in a vacuum. Right. So when objects collide, energy is exchanged between those two objects. So if you think of having a big red ball out there in, in space, space being your accounting firm and the big red ball being CRM and the little red balls are all the people that work for your firm. If everybody misses the big red ball then there's no energy coming out of CRM. But if everybody's colliding with it, the more you collide, the more energy comes out to everyone in the firm, right? And that's that's really what, what that adoption piece is, is really all about. I didn't expect to get into physics today, so you've surprised me. So <laughs> let's... <laughs> <laughs> Let's switch to a uh, MarTech budget. Now, what should that look like and how can cost conscious firms keep costs reasonable? And aren't they all cost conscious, I suppose? But yeah, how can we keep those costs reasonable? I'm trying to say, say this without upsetting people. Um, here, here's, here's the reality. Right. If I go to somebody and I say, okay, how much does your office space cost? And they give me a number, right? And then that's, and then how much does your office space profit you? And they said, well, if it doesn't, right? It's just the place that we go to work. And then I say, well, how much does your HR system cost? And how much money do you make off your HR system? And they laugh at you. And I say, well, how much is your time and billing system cost? And you get into the same exercise. Marketing, MarTech investments are the only investment you know, that a firm can make outside of people that actually can pay for itself. So... It's, it's interesting because people say, well, Danny, I know you've been in this business for 20 something, 30 years. And I know that in your firm, you have the philosophy not to ever ask a customer what their budget is. And, and I said, I, I don't because to, to actually gain an ROI or to gain a positive effect to the firm in a MarTech spend is is it's such a low hurdle. Imagine if you watched the Olympics and they had the orange hurdle race, right? That's literally how ridiculous this conversation is around budget. Because when I'm talking to, you know, picks or MPs about the investment, I have this conversation often. I had it 
had a new firm signed yesterday and one signed the day before. And the conversation with the managed partner is, if you give me a dime today, that dime being the MarTech investment, um, I'll give you a dollar back for your shareholder checks by the end of the year. That's what the budget conversation really is in, in, in relation to MarTech investments, because we see the spend on the increase, right? Um, you know, I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, I used to work for an AI stack that's heavily in the in the in the the relationship intelligence and data quality, and you know that's another that I see accounting firms spending heavily on. Um, you know, probably forty two out of the top fifty firms have that same technology. Um, but the budgeting question um, is really more about. Um, finding the right fit to start realizing actual results as as fast as humanly possible. So if you can't find more tech investments that can literally start providing ROI in four to six weeks, either you're overthinking it or you're overspending. Right. And that's really kind of how I approach the 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 budgetary spend you know later on i'll give you my contact info happy happy to discuss with anybody their individual situation but you know in today's world there's some pretty affordable um pretty affordable technologies um uh, very low barriers to entry um very easy to use um so the budget if, if a firm has a problem buying these technologies, then you might want to reassess who you're marketing for. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the question. I yeah, mean, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. So let's let's move to AI and some other cool new technologies. Um, anything that's recently come to the market, or what should be looking? What should we be looking for soon? Well, we're starting to see some of the the marketing automation stacks start to um, do enrichment. So being able to provide you more information than just, you know, hey, I, I have a contact name and an email address and they showed up in CRM. But then when I look there, there's the company's logo and their website and their address and and other information that I certainly didn't enter. Um, so I, I think I think the automated enrichment, right? There's no reason if you have a stack that provides that why you wouldn't want to turn it on. Um, I did a very interesting cycle as it relates to like the concept of chatbots and generative AI chatbots, that kind of thing. Um, and in looking at the top, 30 firms, not a single one of them had one on their website. <laughs> um, so I think there's, I think people, basically what we find is there's so much content on a lot of accounting firm websites. Um, they're having a, a, a difficult time figuring out how to apply this. And so what I have seen, because I did talk to a couple of, of firms in the in the top 10, and they did kind of run me through things that they're working on as it relates to to AI, um, and and those chatbots and, and in certain use cases, certain areas, and what they're working on is very cool. So I think that is up and coming. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, I mentioned, you know, um, that other technology stack where you know basically all of the contacts and and accounts for these firms that have this relationship intelligence uh, stack have all of their contacts and accounts automatically generated on a daily basis so that people have to enter any data i think that's really cool i think that's i think it's been a you know uh, a game changer for a lot of these firms because that's table stakes if your contacts and accounts aren't in crm or marketing automation you can't play the game, right? And the time and effort that it takes to get those in there, much less keep them updated, because that's the other thing that AI is doing now is that, you know, literally AI can tell you, hey, 
I don't think this person works here anymore. I think they work there, <laughs> you know, and, or I think their titles changed or, you know, things like that. So 90% of all the data that's out there it was generated within the last 12 months. So the acceleration of data creation is insane and anything that AI can do predictably um, is, is a good thing that you should try and leverage. Um, we also see that there is now more interest in, you know, you can't do anything these days without mentioning like a chat GPT and how and where does it apply to me? Um, and of course, you know, there's always this concept of unique content, right? Because, you know, even the players on the search side, as marketers well know, they, they, they've upset the apple cart somewhat in that unless content's unique, they kind of disregard it, right? So in order to get yourself up the search rankings and things like that. So there are technologies now that are actually starting to bring, um, you know, AI even into the MarTech stacks from, from that perspective. Uh, the other thing that we'll see, depending on which CRM technology you utilize, is um, we're starting to see things like predictions, next best actions, um, you know, so it, it's taking a look or, you know, in, in my CRM, um, you know, when I go to an account and then all of a sudden when I look at all the activities on the right hand side, you know, it'll, it'll even tell me whether there are insights that I should click on and it'll, it'll, it'll basically, it provides me a synopsis and a direction of what I should, you know, here's the information we think is valuable that might pertain to what you bought this CRM technology for, which is doing more business. So those, those are the things that, that, you know, we're seeing right now. Wow. Interesting stuff. So is there anything else you'd like people to know, <clears throat> excuse me, before we sign off, perhaps some upcoming event or program, anything going on? Uh, so we all know about AIM Summit. And um, so that's, that's one thing that's really cool. So we're a sponsor there again this year. So one of the things that we'll be doing is we'll actually be showcasing um, two integrations, one of that relationship intelligence technology that I talked about, and also time and billing with one of the most popular time and billing platforms into the same MarTech stack. So We'll be doing that at Summit in May. Um, before that, a month earlier, um, I'll also be kind of giving a, a rundown on, you know, what current MarTech stacks look like at Winding Rivers uh, Digital Deep Dive Conference in, in Georgia and in, in Atlanta and, and at the beginning of April. So that's that's what's coming pretty soon. How can our listeners best get in touch with you or find out more about Rare Karma? Okay. Um, so they can, a very complicated email address, it's danny at rarekarma.com, um, or they can go to rarekarma.com itself, and there, what they'll find is they'll find um, both sections on specific technologies, um, but they'll also find an area uh, that's dedicated to accounting, legal, and consulting firms, so... That's about it. Great, great. So that's it for another episode of Amplify, the podcast podcast for accounting firm growth. A big thanks to all of you for listening in today. If you like what you heard, we'd love a review on the podcast platform you're listening to us on now. And be sure to listen to the other episodes in the digital lead gen season. You can learn more about Amplify and our past seasons on accountingmarketing.org. Look for the podcast under publications. And if you want to learn more about me, reach out on LinkedIn at Chris Camara, that's Chris with a C and C-A-M-A-R-A, -A -A, or email me at ccamara at ipainsider.com. And thank you very much again. We look forward to having you join us for another episode soon.